I, I wanted to have uh, about 50 microns minimum clearance at the highest point on the cornea. Now remember in graphs, the highest point is often not central. In keratoconus, it's usually within a couple of millimeters of uh, the visual axis. But in these cases with graphs, the highest point is often close to the edge of the graft. So when we're judging the base curve, we're judging it along the, the edge of the graft, not centrally at all. I wanted to have a landing zone here. Uh, um, you can see here less than a millimeter wide just inside the limbus. I wanted to have clearance uh, over that the limbus of about 20 to 30 microns. It, because you don't have sufficient fluorescent, it will look like touch, but you still have some clearance. And then I want to run parallel to the sclera or the conjunctiva to maximize tear exchange underneath the lens. So your choice of base curve is controlled by the highest point on the cornea. You don't look centrally. You're looking along the highest point on the cornea. And if you have the luxury of an OCT, you can see the graft here. So we've cleared the graft here by about 50 microns. Our landing zone is out here. And here's the limbus. So our landing zone is just inside the limbus here. So what are the primary indications for this lens? The primary indications are post-surgical oblate corneas, such as post-graft. PRK and LASIK. Um, all those conditions, and even RK, where we had those nasty cuts in the cornea, can be fitted with this design. Secondary indications, basically any oblate cornea that cannot be fitted successfully within the limbus, so with a corneal lens, uh, extremely flat corneas like cornea plana. I've only ever seen two cases of corneal plana in my whole lifetime of, of practicing but where the TLA is excessively deep over the central cornea. So we're trying to reduce the TLA centrally over that central cornea. So you would not fit this design on keratoconus. It is, I make that very clear. If you try to fit it on a prolate cornea, you'll be unsuccessful and you won't be able to remove the lens off the eye easily at all. It's not suitable for prolate corneas. So what is a prolate cornea? A prolate cornea is steeper centrally here. It gets flatter as we move out uh, into the mid periphery and flatter still as we move out to the limbus. An oblate cornea is flatter centrally, as you can see here. It's steeper just outside that central area, and then you flatten the lens out again here. So it's quite these two shaped corneas require different types of lenses. So the design is an aspheric back optic, as was all my Rose K do designs. It has front surface aberration control, which all my Rose K designs do have. You have that precise edge of control, which uh, if you use my designs, uh, I will go through with you in a moment. And it has significant reverse geometry in all base curves, which increases the amount of reverse geometry. It's more and more as the base curve flattens. So as we get a flatter here, we have to steepen that, that, that mid-peripheral curve with that reverse geometry. So it means that the curve immediately outside the optic zone is actually steeper than the optic zone area. So you have a very wide range of parameters which you need for these corneas. You can see it goes um, as flat as 10. You don't need to go very steep at 7 here. Standard diameter 14.6, but you've got a large range of diameters and 0.1 steps, basically any power. And you have a huge range of edge lift options from minus six to plus six and 0.5 steps. So I'll talk more about that as we go through. The standard lift is designated zero, the standard increase lift plus one, and the standard decrease lift minus one. I also offer in this design toric peripheries front surface torics or front torics, quadrant specific edge lift lenses, and ACT. And we'll cover that off at the end of the towards the end of the lecture. For those that fit my designs, you'll know that I advocate a five-step fitting system. And you fit it in this order. You start with the base curve, 
Then you address the peripheral fit or the edge lift. You then look at the diameter of the location and finally the lens movement. So let's go through these and, and look at them. So your base curve selection, you select the flattest base curve, which shows no touch over the highest point on the cornea. Now, that is a little different than a corneal lens, which I talk about feather touch. With these lenses, I'm talking about the flatter space curve that shows no touch. And that will give you, uh, with an OCT, uh, an ideal clearance at this point of about 50 microns. You adjust then the peripheral fit to optimize fluorescent circulation under the edge of the lens. And then the, you move the diameter. The diameter is controlled by the size of the cornea. Uh, for a normal cornea of 11.8 millimeters, that's the average in the world, uh, it'll give you a, about a 1.4 lap if the diameter is correct. You then look at the location and adjust the parameters so the lens sits evenly around the limbus, and then you look to see if you have any movement at all. So let's go through those uh, in detail. So let's start with the base curve. You choose the first lens based on a condition guide, and I'll show you the condition guide in a moment. You fill the concave side of the lens with non-preserved saline, and you add plenty of fluorescent. Don't be afraid to put a lot of fluorescent in the back of the lens. You then select, you change the lenses until you get the flattest base curve that shows no touch at the highest point on the cornea. And at that highest point, I want to see about 50 to a maximum of 100 microns clearance at the highest point on the cornea. So when you think you've got the right base curve, but perhaps you're not sure, to check that this is optimum, if you go 0.1 flatter with the base curve, you then should see feather touch. So you would then know that the previous lens was the correct base curve. For initial evaluation, the fluorescent pattern can be judged immediately after insertion. You don't have to wait uh, 20 minutes to, to look at the initial pattern. So once the lens is a correct fit is attained with the base curve, allow the lens to settle for a further 20 minutes and reevaluate the fit. Usually the lens will settle back a little bit over that period of time. If more fluorescent is required, place it on the sclera at 12 o'clock, just above the lens, ask the patient to blink a few times. And if fluorescent doesn't enter behind the lens, just manipulate the lens by pushing around the lower lid onto the base of the lens to get the fluorescent uh, circulating underneath the lens. Please remember it is imperative that the fit does not show bearing at the highest point on the cornea. If you do, uh, you can end up with a problem and you can get corneal damage binding and discomfort may result. So there is a condition guide which gives you a rough guide for your first trial lens. If it's a graft, it's 0.3 flatter than the mean K. If it's PIK and post-LASIK, it's also 0.3 flatter than the mean K. However, for RK, radial keratotomy, uh, you have to go significantly steeper than the mean K with your first trial lens. This can only ever be an approximate guide, however, for your first trial lens. So there is, with Oblate, there is another way of determining your first trial lens. You'll note with the trial set, it has sagittal height written on each lens. Now with the XL lens, my normal corneal scleral lens, uh, it doesn't have the sagittal height on it. But with the oblate design, it does show the sagittal height. So if the sag height of the eye is known at 14.6 millimeters, and some instruments will measure that, match this with the closest sag height shown on the trial lenses. Alternatively, if the sag of the cornea only is available, use the sag height at 11.6, so we're still within the cornea, to calculate the first lens. So what you do is you take the sagittal height of the eye at 11.6 millimeters, you add 1400 microns, so here we see an example where the sagittal height was, was 2.4430, you add the 1400 and that gives you 3.8430. So you look at the trial set, and that would equate to uh, the closest trial lens, which is 8.2, which has a sagittal height of 3.876. So you can use sagittal height and uh, to calculate your first trial lens. 
However, if your sagittal heights, topography, or mean case are unavailable, I suggest you start with your first trial lens at around 7.8 millimeters. But this is an ideal fit. You can see we don't have feather touch anywhere around the edge of the graft. This is getting a little bit flat. You can see here's the graft edge. This is the highest point, and that's bearing too heavily on the edge of the graft. So I would want to go steeper than that, about 0.1 steeper. If you have an OCT, in this image, we've got a nice 50 or 60 microns clearance here at the graft junction, whereas in the right image, this is a flatter base curve. We don't have sufficient, this is only probably about 20 or 30 microns clearance. So this would tend to show a feather touch with the fluorescent pattern. Here's a case, uh, and this is a graft again, or oh, sorry, it's post-LASIK, this one, where the patient blinks and you see just see the touch, and then you see tears circulate under it. This would work extremely well. This is an ideal uh, um, base curve selection. So here we have, if we go through them, once again, don't judge it centrally, judge it along the edge of the graft. You can see it here. Uh, we've got a little bit of touch, so this is slightly flat. This is definitely showing a little bit more touch than I want. And these two are obviously flat. This would cause problems. This would require a, a lens at least 0.2 to 0.3 steeper, and this one even going 0.4 steeper uh, to get the correct fit. So if you have an OCT, you can verify that once you think you've got the right lens. Here you can see a lens which is touching inside the graft. Uh, it lifts off outside the graft, and then we have touch out here. So this would cause problems. This is probably about 0.1 to flat. Interesting to note, with corneal lenses, if the, if the lens is flat, the lens moves a, a lot. So the flatter you make a corneal lens, the more it tends to move. That's not the case with the corneal scleral lens or with the scleral lens. If you fit a lens flat, as you can see here, it tends to bind back onto the cornea and not move. So even though this lens is very, very flat, it's not moving at all. So any way to get it moving would be to steepen the base curve up. So typically, you want to get it moved more, you steepen the base curve. And again, we are flat here by about 0.1. Going to the OCT images, all these images show not enough clearance underneath the edge of the lens. All these fits would be unsuccessful because they are too flat. You notice in this one, I have put the title Rose K2XL, not Rose K2XL oblate. The reason why is if you're fitting over corneal rings, you only, uh, the, the cornea is still typically not oblate. It's still prolate. If you look at the pattern here, you can still see we've got, even though we have got the rings in place, we still see a prolate shape. We still see a cone. So if you're fitting over corneal rings, don't use the oblate design. It's not suitable. You are much better just to use my normal design, the Rose K2XL regular design, which is recommended for rings. So uh, for, for post-corneal rings, this lens is not recommended. So for RK, it is suitable. You'll still often end up with quite a bit of pulling centrally because often in cases, with these cases, you've got four or 500 microns of flattening centrally over that RK position. So when you're fitting, where are you looking for the fit? You're judging it at the highest point. Here is the highest point at the edge of the, uh, 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 where the scars have been cut in. Again, you can see the scarring here or the cuts. This is far too flat. This is probably at least 0.2 to 0.3 too flat. This would not be successful. It would bind to the cornea. So here's one you say, you put this lens in, you say, now, is that steep or is it okay? The only way you can tell is go 0.1 flatter and immediately you go 0.1 flatter. You can see now we are seeing a little bit of touch over the highest point. So you know that this fit was correct because going 0.1 flatter, we started to see touch, which we don't want. So moving now, once you've done the base curve to the peripheral edge lift, 
And I talked about having many edge lift options. However, there are five standard edge lift options. The standard, which has a, a zero rating and your trial set will typically always be in a standard edge lift. The standard increase, which has a plus one rating. The standard decreased, which has a minus one rating. You then have a double increased and a double decrease. So those are the five standard options. But you have many, many more options than that. You have a range of options from minus six decrease to plus six increased. So that range of options mean you should be able to fit the peripheral fit very, very precisely to get that correct tear exchange uh, and uh, movement with the lens. But typically, the, these three standard lifts will fit over 60% of the cases you see. So with the peripheral fit, you observe the fluorescent pattern outside the limbus at the last one minute to 1.5 millimeters at all positions around the clock. That's important. You can observe the fluorescent pattern immediately after the lens insertion, and you're aiming to get a fluorescent band 0.8 to 1 millimeter wide. If you leave it too long to observe the fluorescent pattern after you put the lens on the eye, uh, the, particularly the edge lift pattern will look tight because the fluorescent will move out from underneath the edge quite quickly. So if you don't have fluorescent, reapply it to the sclera, few blinks, move the lens around a bit to make sure you get fluorescent underneath the edge of the lens up to the limbus. If the edge lift is correct, you should see fluorescent circulate under the edge of the lens. So this is what we're trying to achieve. You can see uh, a nice fluorescence uh, underneath, not a heavy pulling, but a nice fluorescence underneath the edge of the lens. So if there's insufficient fluorescent uh, underneath the edge, you increase the lift, and vice versa. If there's not an excessive amount, you're going to decrease the lift. Um, obviously, uh, looking around the clock, you might find the patterns uh, not the same around the clock. I will cover that off uh, in, in a few moments. So the conjunctival vessels should be visible through the fluorescent. When we get um, the edge lift too high, you'll find the conjunctival vessels will start to disappear. So you should be able to see the vessels underneath the edge uh, with the correct amount of fluorescent. I mentioned the big range. Uh, your trial set will be uh, in a standard lift typically. But if you put the lens in, and this is what you see, you simply order a standard lift. However, if your trial lens and all these pictures are taken with a standard lift trial set. So if this, this is what you see, this is now getting too tight, and you would have to order a plus one increased lift to lift the edge of that lens to give you this correct pattern. This is getting far too tight. We're not getting any fluorescent at all underneath the edge of the lens. You'd have to order a plus two. And these are now getting too open. We can't see those conjunctival vessels. We're going to have to order a minus one or a, uh, a standard decrease lift. And here we're getting even bubbles starting to enter underneath the edge of the lens. We're going to have to go to a minus two decrease lift. And do remember you've got all these uh, 0.5 steps in between that, and you've got a whole range of 25 edge lift options. So looking a little bit more closely at the peripheral fit, all these are acceptable fits. And you'll notice that they don't all look exactly the same. For example, here you might say, well, it looks like a little bit too much lift there. It's fine there. But if the patient's comfortable, we're not getting any bubbles, and you're happy with the way the lens is moving, then it doesn't matter if you have a little bit of different patterns around the clock. You don't have to have a perfect pattern all around the clock. If you have an OCT, uh, you can check at the edge. It's quite time consuming to do that going around the clock, but you can check to make sure you can see the lift off at the edge of the lens like you see here and here. However, if we've got excessive amount of the fluorescent, you can see here, we can't see the really see the conjunctival vessels here or here. We're starting to get bubbles under this one here. You can see those little bubbles. 
because they are entering underneath the edge of the lens and you can see it even more so in this in this picture here so all in all these images we have to decrease the edge lift to make that lens fit better in the periphery and you can see here this is far too open that patient would feel very uncomfortable with that lens they would feel the edge of the lens where they blinked uh, and the lens may move excessively so moving to a tight edge if you start to see a dark edge as you can see here that indicates that you need to increase the edge lift here again uh, this is indicating we got that tight edge lift around here we're going to need it to increase the edge lift uh, at least in this area here again here getting a little bit tight in the periphery and this one you can see we're getting no fluorescent underneath the edge definitely too tight in the periphery so looking in more detail this is a post laser case case the lens is a little bit flat centrally we can see the touch we don't want that we would need to go point one steeper with our base curve and we are far too tight in the periphery this is going to require at least a plus one if not a plus 1.5 to open up that edge lift and if we have an oct you can see here if you're too tight in the periphery the epithelium on the conjunctiva pushes up to the edge of the lens and you can see here in this case we're extremely tight in the periphery and the epithelium on the conjunctiva is pushing right up to the, be level with the front surface of the lens so this is uh, not ever going to be successful one test which is quite useful which is i call the uh, push up or push down test to find out how easily fluorescent enters underneath the edge of the lens so here you can see uh, as i push that tear layer up as soon as the the tear layer uh, in front of the the tear meniscus in front of the lid uh, touches the edge of the lens you can see how freely those tears flow underneath the edge of the lens you can do it superiorly uh, or inferiorly uh, just to check you should not use have to use any force much at all to see the tear layer uh, with the fluorescent move underneath the edge of the lens here you can see this is too tight even though i'm pushing right up to the edge of the lens i'm not getting any fluorescent here with a lot of pressure i'm getting a little bit of fluorescent under but that is still far too tight in the periphery so this is a very very important part of the uh, fit the edge lift is judged by several things we've, we've covered the fluorescent pattern movement i will cover in a moment lens comfort is important if you put the lens in and the patient says my gosh that's very comfortable i can't feel it you probably have a tight edge lift an edge which is tight is very very comfortable initially but long term it's not good for the cornea and causes problems we've also talked about how easily the fluorescent enters underneath the edge of the lens um, and that is a very good test to make sure that the tear layer or the tears exchange freely from the edge of the lens into the optic area the other thing is how easy the lens is to remove the lens should not be very difficult to remove if you have the correct edge lift so you can see here you always place the plunger towards the edge of the lens and it should come out quite freely like that if you have to use excessive force to remove the lens it's very likely your edge lift is too tight so we now have done the base curve and the peripheral fit we're going to move to the overall diameter so corneal spiral lenses uh, you can see here are very similar to soft lenses they sit outside the limbus here by about uh, 1.4 millimeters whereas spiral lens which often tend to locate inferiorly temporally uh, have a much wider lap outside the edge so this is not a typical of a scleral lens pattern this is an 18 millimeter scleral lens so the trial lens diameter is 14.6 but remember you have a large range of diameters in 0.1 steps are right up to 16 millimeters and going down to 13.6 millimeters the lens is, if the lens diameter is correct it should extend outside the limbus by about 1.3 to 1.5 millimeters 
So if your cornea is the normal size, that's the average size of 11.8, you will find the trial lens will give you that lap. But if your cornea is smaller, you'll have a bigger lap. If the cornea is uh, very large, you won't have sufficient lap. So your diameter is governed by the size of your cornea. And changing the diameter of the lens will not affect the central fit. So what you're aiming at is a 1.3 to 1.5 lap outside the limbus. So it's very, very similar to a soft lens. Do remember the diameter must be evaluated right around the clock because typically uh, you often get less lap in the horizontal meridian than you do in the vertical. And you can see here in the vertical meridian, we've got quite a, a significant uh, lap outside the limbus. But here we're getting probably uh, down to one, just over one millimeter. So we don't really have sufficient lap in that. So when you're judging it, look around the clock. It's where you have the least amount of coverage outside the limbus. That's going to determine your diameter. So this is getting okay to getting slightly large. This is getting a little bit larger than we would like. You'll decrease the diameter. And here we don't have sufficient diameter. This is less than one millimeter. This would be uncomfortable for the patient. And we'd probably get bubbles entering at this point when the patient blinks. So here again, the diameter is too small. This is on a graph. You can see the edge of the lens right here. Uh, we have probably only 0.5 a millimeter. This is much too small, this lens. It would not be successful on this graft. Again here, this is less than a millimeter, definitely too small. So we've done the first three. We then move to location. These lenses usually sit fairly evenly around the limbus. It may locate slightly temporally. If it's slight, it doesn't matter. It may locate towards the highest point on the cornea. If it's only slightly mislocated, that's fine. Slight decentration is not significant. However, if the centration is very significant, it can cause discomfort in corneal staining. So here you can see in this case the edge of the lens here, that this is decentering down uh, quite significantly. You can see the edge of the LASIK area just uh, here and here. So this lens is centering down. What can you do about it? You can flatten the base curve in some instances, but this is not going to be an option here because I can see that if we flatten the base curve, we're going to have touch, or you can make the lens bigger. So in this case, what I would do to try to get better centration is increase the diameter by at least 0.6 to 1 millimeter. Then we lens to lens movement. Now, in scleral lenses, we don't tend to talk about movement, but in my designs, corneal scleral, I like to see some movement. So I like the patient to look up, look at the bottom of the lens, and on first insertion, I want to see it moving about 0.5 to 1 millimeter on blinking. After 20 minutes, once the lens settles, though, uh, 0.5 millimeters to just discernible movement. So you don't see a lot of movement, uh, not dissimilar to a soft lens. And if you've got excessive movement, it will be uncomfortable for the patient. So this is excessive. This lens is moving um, more uh, than I would like. Uh, I would want to shut that down by decreasing the edge lift. And this one here is not moving at all. It's just about bound to the cornea here. So I'd want to do some change to the lens to actually increase the movement. So here's a post uh, LASIK cornea here. And you can see here we have a very wide landing zone. The edge lift here looks good. It's a wee bit too open here. We've got a few bubbles entering in centrally i'm not worried because remember i said don't worry about the central fit worry about the highest point on the cornea which is around here so how do we get rid of that wide landing zone because if you have a wide landing zone the lens will not move it uh, it tends to bind to the cornea if you look at these uh, pictures here we have a 7.0 lens with a very wide landing zone. I've increased the steepness of the base to 6.9 and immediately see the landing zone has got less width. Going steeper again to 6.8, we now have a very, very good 
width of landing zone. This is ideal. This is exactly what I want to see. By going steeper again, I really haven't achieved much more. So I would have, in this case, gone with a 6.8 pace curve. This gives a very, very nice bit here in that landing zone area. So how do we change the lens movement? If you want to increase it, you increase the edge lift, the same as a corneal lens. What is different than a corneal lens, however, is you would steepen the base curve to increase the movement. Whereas uh, if you want to decrease the movement, you would flatten the base curve and you'd decrease the edge lift. So increasing the diameter may reduce the movement in some cases, but not necessarily so. I want to move on now to some problem solving. Um, if you have problems fitting this lens, so if the patient complains of discomfort or tolerance during, uh, particularly on first insertion or during wear, be aware. Asking the patient how the lens feels is gives you some very useful information. The lids are very, very sensitive to an edge lift which is too high. So they might say to you, gee, I can feel the lens up here. And if you look there, you'll find often your edge lift is excessive in that area. So do always ask the patient, how do this lens feel? If they don't feel it, edge lift is probably too tight. So there should be some sensation when you put it in. When you put it in, oh yeah, I can feel the lens, but it's not too bad. So if you have excessive edge lift, uh, it'll be discomfort, you would decrease it. If you have too much movement, it will cause discomfort. If you have a lens which is not big enough, it will cause discomfort. If you have a base curve that is excessively too steep or too flat, both those will cause you discomfort. And the most common probably is poor alignment with the sclera or the conjunctiva, and I'll cover toric and asymmetric options, how to fix that in a moment. So as I mentioned, there should be some sensation on first insertion. How about when they, they say to you, geez, it's been pretty good where I wear the lens, but I take it out and I want to rub my eyes and they look red and I'm, I'm not happy. It takes quite a few, uh, five or 10 minutes for my eyes to settle down after I take the lens out. So you'd look for limbal compression on removal, see if the lens is indenting into the conjunctiva or the cornea. Have you got a tight edge? Do you need to loosen it? Is there sufficient movement? How can I increase the movement? I've covered that for you. And do you have uh, enough tear circulation, which means you've got to fit over, loosen that fit overall by either increasing the edge lift or steepening the base curve. What about poor acuity? If you find that the patient's not getting good, good acuity with the final lens when you do their refraction, do you always use a, a over correction and check to make sure there's no residual astigmatism because you can add that to the front surface uh, of the lens. So the front toric um, is designed to correct any residual astigmatism. The lens is prism ballast to turn it to the right position. You have a big range of um, cylinder powers, even up as high as 12 doctors. I've never gone the highest I've described as eight doctors. And that was in a case where the patient had had a toric um, lens after a cataract operation. So not ideal at all. But I've often used two or three diopters uh, on, on this uh, on a front surface lens in either this design or the normal XL design. Around the clock axis, the standard amount of prism put in the lens is 1.25. But if that doesn't locate the lens, you can increase it up to two diopters of prism. And there'll be a marker a line or a dot at the base of the prism. The fitting will not affect the location of the lens. Not like with the corneal lens, sometimes when you add it to a front toric, the lens will tend to center down further, uh, but it doesn't tend to happen with uh, XLO blade. However, with one word of warning, if you wish to include residual astigmatism, then it is imper imperative to exclude lens warpage which can cause this. If your lens warps on the front, that can cause you to produce residual astigmatism. So how do you check that out? All you do is a topography or a K reading over the front of the lens while it's still on the eye. This will determine where the cylinder is rising from. So if the map 
the topography map is relatively spherical over the pupil, then this confirms that the astigmatism is arising from the tear layer or, or internal. And you can add it to the front of the lens. If the map shows irregular astigmatism, but no significant regular astigmatism, then the lens needs to be increased. So if your topography over the lens still shows an irregular type of pattern, the overall lens thickness needs to be increased. The laboratory can advise you on that. If the map shows regular astigmatism, then this shows the lens has warped in the two meridians. And the, the best answer then is to use a toric periphery. And often the amount of warpage that you measure is a guide to how much tericity you have to put on the lens. So for example, um, if you found that the amount uh, of tericity between the five to seven millimeter simkase on your topography was, for example, 7.2 over 6.6, then that would indicate a toric periphery is indicated of 0.6 difference. Um, do remember that uh, XL oblate is a thin lens. I don't apologize for that. I try to keep the lens as thin as possible to maximize um, oxygen exchange to the lens. So over the overall thickness of the lens is about 0.2 if we average the thickest part to the thinnest part. But you can increase the center thickness up to 0.28 if you need to. What about bubbles? I see this so often when I'm in workshops where um, they'll insert the lens and you'll see a bubble. Now, is it a insertion bubble or a post-insertion bubble? So if you put a lens in and you immediately see this, it's most likely to be uh, uh, caused by uh, incorrect insertion. The biggest mistake I see is the patient, is the practitioner, not pushing the lens back onto the eye. Do make sure that your patient's eye is horizontal to the floor and make sure that you, the lids are clear of the, uh, of the limbus before you put the lens onto the eye. So if you see this, you would look at it and say, well, the lens is flat. There's no point in putting a lens of the same base curve back in. I would go look at that and say, well, I need to go at least 0.1 steeper with my next trial lens. So you can still judge it uh, before you put your next trial lens in. The other thing, Base curve is flat in this case. Is the edge lift ex uh, excessive? A bit hard to tell here, but it doesn't look too bad to me. Uh, that looks pretty nice. I don't see any excessive fluorescent here. So my base curve being flat uh, could contribute to that bubble. Diamond is okay? It certainly is. If the diamond was too small, that could cause the bubble as well. Does it require an asymmetric option? Well, until we get the base curve correct, we won't know that. But looking at round the clock, I don't think it needs an asymmetric option. I think it needs simply to steepen the base curve. How about you put the lens in, it looks great, and then a few minutes later you look at the lens and it's got some small bubbles as you can see here in this video. Those bubbles can only come in at the edge of the lens. They can't magically appear out of the cornea. So if, if you get bubbles like this, after you've inserted the lens, you've got to pay attention around the clock to find out where you have excessive edge lift. Because either you have the diameter too small or you have the edge lift too high will allow those bubbles to enter. And then you've got to close the edge lift down. In this case, the edge lift is too high right around the clock. So you would need to close the edge lift down and use a decreased lift. Important to observe where the bubbles are entering because they'll always end up centrally or superiorly um, in the lens, but so often they will enter inferiorly. And you can see here, as the patient is blinking, the edge of the lens is coming up to the limbus, a bubble is entering in, it's moving up and over the pupil. So what can we do? We definitely need to steepen the base curve in this case. Um, the edge lift is as excessive. We won't know that until we get the correct base curve. Is the diameter too small? It is. If you look when the patient's blinking, we don't have sufficient coverage here. That's why the bubble's coming in. We need to go bigger. Can we use ACT? ACT is where you tuck the bottom of the lens in, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. So if you leave the diameter small like this, you can cause bubbles 
as you can see in both of these two pictures. What about corneal staining? If you get circular staining, as you can see here, that staining here, you can't get that unless the lens is not moving. So if the lens is moving, you will not get heavy staining like this. So circular ring staining is caused by lack of movement. Centralized staining, like you can see here, is often caused by preserved saline being used. So what they've inserted behind the lens is, is whatever solution they're using is causing a toxic reaction to the cornea. So to finish off this lecture, just to talk about the asymmetric options available. We've talked about a front surface toric. What about ACT? So ACT is where the bottom of the lens typically is tucked in. So you can also have reverse ACT where the bottom of, or where the lens is, is tucked out in one quadrant. For example, if you had a penguicular uh, at three or nine o'clock that you had to lift the lens over, you could use reverse ACT to go over the top of that penguicular. So if we do represent what happens when we use ACT, if this is the edge of the lens, this is the limbus, when we add ACT, it is normally required at 270, what happens is the lens is steepened in that, in that half of the lens. It starts steepening from just under the horizontal and it gets its maximum steepening at the bottom. So this might mean that as the inferior lens steepens, it might tighten up your inferior edge. Just be aware of that. That happens in some cases. So what are the ideal cases for ACT? Here's an ideal case. This base curve is not steep enough. Well, I can see that here, but this is going to require ACT to actually tighten that bottom area. And this one, again, we've got too much lift off. We're going to actually have to tuck the bottom of that lens in. There is a laser mark put at the uh, axis of the ACT that would normally locate at around about six o'clock. But if it moves round, as you can see here, this lens has not got sufficient prism in it to stabilize it. You would just ask the, lens, the lab to give you more prism. So you can have different uh, axes for the prism and the axe, but so often the prism and the axe are in the same axis. What about quadrant-specific edge lifts? How do they vary? If you order a quadrant-specific edge lift, all you'll do is change the fit basically outside that red circle, so outside the limbus. So here you can see here that nothing will change on the peripheral cornea or under the optic zone. If you order a quadrant-specific edge lift, all that will change is the fit in the periphery. And you can order different edge lifts in different quadrants. So you might have to say, well, I'd like standard edge lift here and here but i want a decreased edge lift here and here so you won't affect the fit on the cornea at all if you do that you'll only affect the fit uh, when you use a quadrant specific edge lift outside of the limbus so here's an example where the fit is too tight in this quadrant here and that's causing injection of the lens in that quadrant so we increase the edge lift in this quadrant between uh, 180 to 270. So the middle of that axis is 225. And immediately we open up that and we get rid of that injection problem. We've got a very nice fit now. So when you're ordering it, I suggest you order the axis at the center of the quadrant that you want to change. And remember, you can change it in four quadrants. They don't have to be at 0, 90, 180, and 270. You can have oblique uh, axes as well. As long as the axes are 90 degrees apart, you can change the quadrants for oblique axes as well. And toric periphery, what happens when we use a toric periphery? The difference here is when we use a toric periphery, we will change the fit over everything outside of the back optic zone. So it will affect the fit on the peripheral cornea and outside the limbus. 
Whereas with the cotton specific edge thrift, remember, we didn't alter the fit on the cornea at all. So if you see the lens is bearing not only at the edge of the lens, but also on the cornea, and it's lifting off in the other opposite meridian, do think about toric peripheries. They're a very useful tool. Toric peripheries should be used in about 40% of cases. They're not. They're only used in about 10 to 15% of cases. And studies, recent studies, have actually shown that less than 10% of scleras are truly spherical, or truly symmetrical. So do think about toric peripheries. They do have a, a lot of help. The standard toric periphery is 1.2, and that what does that mean? It means that if you order a toric periphery standard, the labs will steepen the uh, lens outside the back optic zone in one, in this case, in the vertical meridian, and they will flatten it by 0.6 in the opposite meridian, that's the flattest meridian, to give you that 1.2 difference between the two meridians. Laser lines will be shown on the lens, front of the lens, and that should locate along your flattest axis. You don't have to state that to the laboratory unless you're also trying to correct residual astigmatism on the front of the lens. So when you put the lens in, it doesn't matter where you put it in, the lens within a couple of blinks will turn around to the correct position. So this is typically uh, a case where the patient should have had a toric periphery but didn't. And so if you see staining on the cornea that comes in from the limbus here, out, also outside on the conjunctiva, and enters over the, the, the peripheral cornea, you probably need to use a toric periphery again here. We don't have staining here, but we have it in the horizontal, should have used a toric periphery. Staining is associated with no movement and with the raw corneal astigmatism. So you can see here, this staining, circular staining, shows that you don't have sufficient movement with the lens. You don't have to try to get the lens to move more. Here is the case. This sort of staining shows that we should have used a toric periphery. We used a spherical lens. The lens is bearing on the cornea here and here on the conjunctiva. Should have used a toric periphery. So to make the lens move more, steepen the base curve, increase the edge lift, or increase the lens thickness will sometimes help the movement as well. And toric periphery in this case is certainly indicated. So with a toric periphery, usually you just put the lens in and it will turn around quite well. And laser larks should be very stable along the flattest axis. So here we have a case where 1.2 standard toric periphery has been used, but we are still too tight in that meridian, and that's allowing little bubbles to enter here and here underneath the lens. By going to a 1.8 difference, we've immediately fixed that problem that we can see here. We've got nice circulation under the lens, so we now have a lovely fitting uh, lens in the periphery. What about a blanching like you can see here? This indicates the mainly that the edge lift is too tight. That lens would be, would be actually sucking onto the eye and bearing heavily on the lens. Is the base curve correct? Have you left it too flat? Have a look at the movement. How can we increase it? If you get a case like this where a patient comes in and you have hyperemia, as you can see here in this case, what should you think about doing with it? Is it lack of oxygen or could it be a problem with the solution? So you should obviously assess the, back, the base curve and the edge lift. But if you find out that they are fine, then do check with the patient that they're not using a preserved solution to insert the lens with. This was a patient of mine that in my original Excel design actually, which did very, very well for a year and then came in and said, Paul, I can't wear the lens as long, and my eyes are getting red at the end of the day. And the base curve fit was good, the peripheral fit was good. I was happy there was no vessels growing in, but I had this qu quite a lot of limbal injection. And I said, what are you using for your insertion solution? And they were using preserved saline, and it was in fact the preserved saline which was causing this problem. As soon as we went to non-preserved solution, we had no problems. Um, this was for a practitioner in Australia that had wetting problems and 
what should you consider to see this lens is not working well. Going to a lower decay material sometimes helps wetting issues like you see here. Are they using the correct care system? A peroxide based system is by far the best for removing deposits. Are they checking, are they cleaning the lens after each time they wear the lens with a surfactant cleaner? And in this case, this, girl, this woman had quite oily cosmetics, which were sitting on the front of the lens. She changed over to a water based uh, cosmetic, which helped. Uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, wetting on the front uh, considerably. So just to, to summarize it up, that's it. Um, one of the common mistakes that I see is fitting the base curve too flat, not paying attention to where they should be looking. Remember, you've got to judge the base curve at the highest point on the cornea, not centrally. You don't leave a feather touch. You want the flattest lens that doesn't show feather touch. In the past, I, with Excel, I've advocated feather touch. I now say I want to clear it. You're better to go slightly steep than slightly flat. Not taking sufficient time to evaluate the edge lift accurately around the clock and not using a turret periphery. That is a very, very underutilized um, asymmetric options. Are not using X, particularly the PMD, but with PMD, you would tend to use a normal XL lens anyway. And I also have seen people try to use oblate design on prolate corneas. It won't work. Um, if you find suddenly that you're not, you're having real trouble getting the lenses out and your, your peripheral fit is fine, you probably don't have a cornea which is oblate enough. So always make sure that you have an oblate cornea for this design. A lot to take in there, but there is a section in the roskelens.com website, the practitioner's section there. If you go into that, uh, into that section, you will find there are guides and other downloads about all my lenses. So if you forgot what I've said today, you can go online and get it. You will need a password to get the fitting guides, uh, the, and the password that you'll need is RK. PRAC, P R A C O seven, and that will allow you to download the fitting guides to use. So I hope you found that entertaining. I'm very happy to uh, take any questions, and I'll hand this back to you now, Jody. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. Uh, uh, I, I think Anita has the questions ready for you. Yes, fire away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. It was a pleasure listening to you and introducing us to the oblate design from the Roske family. Um, I have not had the experience of fitting the oblate design. So the first question is from me. Um, if I have successfully fit a post draft case with an Excel prolate design, should I consider refitting with an oblate design during the reorder or should I just let it be? It's a, always an interesting question. If a patient is doing well, you don't have any problems with the vision or the cornea, and seeing them regularly, you're seeing them every six months for a check, just leave it alone. Because an old, an old um, rule of thumb that says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, which simply means if everything is fine, cornea's healthy, vision's good, patient's happy, don't bother to refit it. Thanks, Dr. Paul. So the next question is from Lavanya, who wants to know, what are the benefits of uh, fitting a rose K to Excel oblate design over a rose K to uh, PG design, considering both are, uh, you know, reverse geometry lenses? Another excellent question. I would always try to fit a corneal lens design on a graft before going to a large semi-scleral or scleral design. Graphs you've got to be so careful with, they damage corneas basically, and you do not want to deprive them of oxygen, otherwise you can get vessel growth. So my answer to this is I'd always try a post-graft design as my first option on a graft. However, in many cases, you just find that a corneal lens won't set it correctly. It's uncomfortable for the patient because of the shape of the cornea. Um, this lens doesn't have as much reverse geometry as the XL oblate design has. 
So it's going to give you a little bit more pulling centrally, which might be significant. So all in all, try the postcraft design first. If that's not successful, you're not getting good vision or comfort or the lens is mislocating, then that would indicate you should move to the XLO blade design. Thanks, Dr. Paul. So uh, another question uh, from Savita. Uh, if there is excessive touch in the landing zone during follow-up visit because of the lens settling back, uh, will increasing the diameter or steepening the base curve help in an oblate design? Uh, the first thing you should do is steepen the base curve. As you saw from that picture I showed you, in, as I steepen the base curve, the landing zone gets uh, 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 thinner and thinner or not as wide. So always in the first instance, try steeping the base curve. However, the diameter is controlled by the size of the cornea. So if your diameter is not big enough, then certainly to give that 1.5 lap outside the limbus, then you should do both. But the first thing is, if the diameter is correct, steep in the base curve would be my first option there. Uh, Dr. Paul, I have a question uh, following the uh, diameter change. How much increase or decrease in uh, diameter should we consider for an effective change in the fitting? Uh, should it be 0.5 or less or more than this? Sorry, would you repeat that question? Um, so uh, if we need to alter the fitting of the lens by either increasing or decreasing the diameter, in this case, probably an increased diameter would help. How much increase in diameter would be um, useful in affecting the change? Okay, so typically you need to make an increase of at least 0.6 millimeters because that remember that's only give you 0.3 each side. So typically to make any significant difference, um, I would go up to a 15 or 15.2 diameter. If I'm decreasing it, um, perhaps not as much, uh, uh, even a 0.4 millimeter change could be quite significant if you're making it smaller. But um, if you're making it bigger, you don't make it just 0.2 bigger, that's not gonna change much. You need to go at least 0.4 and typically 0.6 difference to make a difference. Thanks, Doctor. I think that's it with the questions. Uh, if there are anything from the chat box, let me. Anita, Anita, there's one more question that Jyoti Ma'am had. Ma'am, do you want to just? Uh... Yeah, I can ask Paul directly. So, yes, uh, uh, Paul, most of us have got the Excel uh, design, the standard set. Uh, not, and not the oblate, oblate uh, set. So my question is that uh, if you are then planning to buy an oblate set, uh, and since most uh, generally 40% of the scleras are toric, uh, do you think as a first uh, choice trial set for Excel oblate, we should buy it with a 1.2 TP rather than a standard normal uh, edge design? A very interesting question, Jody, and I have to think of this one very carefully because when I put out the Excel, the normal Excel design, I recognized that that it was that the sclera was definitely toric in the majority of patients. And I, I contacted several fitters from around the world and said who had used Excel, and I said, do you think the trial set should be in a toric design? And what the answer I got back was they said no, that they can change, looking at the pattern, they can look at it and they can then judge that they need to use a toric periphery. They don't need a toric periphery set to judge that they need a toric periphery. However, if you're doing a lot of fits, to have both is wonderful. And when I travel around um, in the world of the past, I always travel with a toric periphery trial set simply because I know that if I don't, Thurus, the patient that I'm trying to fit, will need a toric periphery. So it's a very underutilized function. As you say, 40% should have toric peripheries, probably 10, 15% maximum of Rose K XL orders around the world are toric peripheries. 
One other thing I thought you were going to ask me is if I've got an XL set, can I use that to fit the oblate lens? The answer is no, you can't, okay? So you can't put the XL on a, a oblate cornea and then say, okay, I want to have that fit. I'll get it dead right with the XL design, but I want to order X oblate. You can't do it. It doesn't work. So uh, if you're going to fit this design, you will have to have an XL oblate trial set. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I, I think that's all the questions we have for you today, Dr. Ball. Um, I'm, we've had over 150 participants who have been with us all through the lecture, which I, I think is an amazing um, attendance uh, for uh, any lecture at all. Uh, because well, usually we start off and then we have a drop and then there's very few left towards the end. Um, so it, it gives me absolute great pleasure in thanking you for uh, having joined us today and uh, delivering this wonderful lecture and introducing us to the oblate design of lenses. Um, I mean, I'm sure as we start fitting, we're going to keep coming up with more questions and more queries. And uh, um, I mean, in my experience, I've been very fortunate that, you know, I've had mentors here uh, who've been able to guide me. So uh, we will be reaching out to you, sir, if we have any questions um, with regards to the follow-ups. Any time at all. I'm here to assist you with any fittings. So don't hesitate to contact me, Serena. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and um, my thanks to Jyoti Ma'am for, um, you know, being in charge of the entire Manicon Center here and giving us guidance and uh, guiding both uh, me and Anita through um, every step of the way. Um, you know, we know that when in doubt, we can always, uh, you know, fall back and ask her and, and she'll be able to tell us what we have to do next. Um, Dr. Anita for uh, being a very integral part of the ACLC and uh, all the participants for having joined us and uh, participating and you know making it interactive with so many wonderful questions. Thank you so much. And if anyone has any questions or any um, you know queries regarding any of the fits, I do have an email ID which I have put in the chat box. So if you can read, direct your questions to the email ID or to the email where you have registered as well, um, we will be able to forward the questions to Dr. Paul for further uh, uh, you know, answers. Um, thank you so very much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all very much.